Hello, we're rolling into another episode of the DRH show. As usual, in each episode, I'll be talking to interesting people within psychology, mental health, and well being. Today, I'm joined by a psychologist from Berkshire, Dr. David Purvis. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Dennis. <laughs> it's great to have you here, Dr. Purvis. Let's start off with you telling us your backstory, your trajectory in life, and how you ended up doing what you're doing. Well, um... Strangely enough, I started out uh, many years ago as a, a North Sea diver. Mm -hmm. so, so for about 12 years, I worked on the oil rigs off the coast of Aberdeen, India, the Mediterranean, all sorts of different places. <clears throat> and I always had a book with me. And it was typically a book about psychology. So when I was about 30, I just thought, oh, I've got to go to university and study psychology, which I did. And I've basically been on the the career path of psychology ever since. So I did an undergraduate degree, then I did a, a, a graduate degree at Oxford and masters and various other degrees. And I've gone from working with um, rats where I, when I started. So I was a behaviorist, uh, behavioral, sort of a neuroscientist in a sense. Mm -hmm. and, I, and then I moved about 20 odd years ago into the row into therapy. And now I pretty much do either CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, or a thing which I've developed called self-help CBT, which I hope I'll get a chance to talk about. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you, you mentioned something about my next question, um, um, CBT. So a lot of people, especially those working within the me mental health field, they probably heard of that. For, but for those who will, doesn't, were not aware about what CBT is, could you just give us a quick, a quick snapshot of what CBT is? Sure. Well. In a sense, most mental health problems, we can think of them as emotional problems. Well, emotional or behavioral problems, mm -hmm. okay? But it's very hard to directly access emotions and change them because to some degree, emotions are affected by what we believe and the experiences we have, like the things that we do. So mm -hmm. with cognitive behavior therapy, we look to change the things people believe, mm -hmm. the, the contents of their consciousness, the images, the memories, etc. And when we change what people think about themselves, the world, the future, the kinds of things they believe about themselves, then their emotions are changed because uh, it just automatically follows that when you change how you think about yourself, you change how you feel about yourself. And also, of course, you change what you do because mm -hmm. it makes more sense to do something different. Mm -hmm. And of course, you specialize on self-help CBT. Yeah. So yeah. How, how long have you been talking about self-help CBT? I have been talking about self-help CBT since before YouTube. I developed one of the first self-help <laughs> CBT programs in the world called Blues Be Gone. Mm. And it's interesting because uh, before Blues Be Gone, people really thought you had to have a therapist mm. to, to make some therapeutic change. But I developed a, a computer program that actually treated clinical depression and clinical anxiety and no therapist, not even any therapeutic contact. Mm -hmm. And I went, well, hang on a minute. If you don't need a therapist, if you don't need a person even, mm -hmm. you can learn this stuff from a computer, then mm -hmm. why don't we make this available to people and so they can help themselves? So that was just a tad over 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. and I've been promoting this idea ever since. I have to say that it has sometimes more traction, sometimes less traction. But mm -hmm. I think it's the way of the future. Mm -hmm. Now, um, of course, um, when we say self CBT is um, a self administered form of CBT, but what I'm curious about is how does it differ from your, let's say, um, traditional form of CBT? Um, is, is that the only difference? Well, um, in CBT, in principle, I mean, I'm simplifying it, but the therapist teaches the client mm -hmm. uh, a, a way of approaching their problems. The therapist mm -hmm. teaches the client tools, strategies, mm -hmm. things to do, okay? So all I've done is I've taken this approach of teaching the client how to do things and I've turned it into a really accessible uh, uh, videos and other tools that someone can access on their phone. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, I've taken out the middleman being the therapist and I've mm -hmm. gone straight to the client. I've said, look, if you worry, this is what you do. If you're anxious, this is what you do. Mm -hmm. And the, once people understand the three elements, really, you have to know what the problem is. You mm -hmm. have to know what to do about it. You have to know how to do it. You've got those three things. You could, a lot of people can help themselves. They don't actually need to have therapy and certainly don't need to have medications. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people will be quite um, skeptical about it. So can you provide us some um, robust evidence that self-help CBT actually work? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Well, um, 
when I started, I was <laughs> I was one of the first people to do um, trials with this. So I did some um, I did clinical trials and randomized controlled trials using my Blues Be Gone program. Mm -hmm. And it turns out, without any therapeutic contact with a human being whatsoever, um, sixty percent of people were cured of clinical depression, and fifty percent were cured of clinical anxiety. Mm -hmm. And each of those categories, another ten percent got really good gains, but they didn't quite meet mm -hmm. the threshold for cured. Now, when you because we use standardized questionnaires, when you compare that to face-to-face -face CBT, then uh, it's about the same as 12 sessions of CBT with a, with a competent professional CBT therapist. Mm -hmm. So actually, I demonstrated uh, in the literature, which was published, that actually self-help CBT is as effective as face-to-face, -face, and you don't need to have a therapist mm -hmm. to administer it. Mm -hmm. um, also, there's... Tons of literature now. If you go into the research literature, face-to-face -face CBT and online CBT, they're more or less equally effective. And so, mm -hmm. really, I think the argument has been made. It's just mm -hmm. a case, as you say, some people might be skeptical, but I think among professionals, the argument has been made that there's very little difference in terms of clinical outcome mm -hmm. between face-to-face -face and, and, and remote CBT. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Purvis, aside from promoting self-help CBT, um, I also understand that you have taken the position that antidepressants should only be, pres be prescribed with self-help CBT. Could you just explain why is that? Um, well, antidepressants, mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a strange story, but antidepressants are not a treatment for mm -hmm. depression. I mean, antidepressants are probably a mind-altering drug whose side effect is emotional blunting, uh, mm -hmm. tranquilization, um, slowing of thought processes. So the side effect of antidepressants is that they might have some, af they might have some calming effect if you're depressed mm -hmm. or anxious. But they're not antidepressants. They don't actually target this thing called depression or this thing mm -hmm. uh, called anxiety. But the, the, kind of, the other interesting element of the argument is that there's very little difference between antidepressants and placebos. Mm -hmm. So... An antidepressant is a mind-altering drug. It has consequences. It has side effects, but it certainly has consequences when people try to come off antidepressants. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. And a, but the placebo has none of these things. And an antidepressant and a placebo, are there's virtually nothing in it. I mean, depending upon the trials, but there's very little in it. So a placebo is probably just as effective as an antidepressant in general. And so I would say, if that's the case, why would we kind of use antidepressants? It's as if we've been mm -hmm. misinformed in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other thing is that um, antidepressants, because they're not a treatment, they don't target the processes which create depression or create anxiety. And so, you know, they may or may not be helpful. Uh, I can say a bit more about this if you're interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, please go on. Yeah, well, if you take an antidepressant, probably any biological effect it's going to have on you has already happened within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. But it often takes two, three, four, five, six weeks to have mm -hmm. a psychological effect. And that's because it's not actually targeting depression or anxiety. Um, and also, the, the, I think doctors have been prescribing antidepressants under a... Um, uh, a misapprehension, uh, not really understanding the effect of withdrawal. Mm -hmm. The National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, they published um, information about this, the, the withdrawal effects of antidepressants. Mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't until 2019 that they updated it to be actually accurate. Before mm -hmm. then, it was based on very sparse information, which basically said withdrawal from antidepressants about one to two weeks and the effects, the negative effects of withdrawal very, you know, self-limiting, wouldn't be a problem. Turns out that over 50% of people have side effects, sorry, uh, withdrawal effects from antidepressants, mm -hmm. and about 49% of those think they're severe, and they can go on for weeks and months. And mm -hmm. because doctors have been misinformed upon uh, about this withdrawal effect, they often go, well, actually, hang on a minute, you're relapsing into depression or you're relapsing into anxiety, and then you, they put you back on the antidepressant. Or, or on a different one. So the whole process is actually, I think, very poorly managed. Anyway, with an antidepressant, you learn nothing about depression. Nothing. So when you, when you leave the antidepressant, you're no wiser than you were before you were put on it. So I think uh, that 
if you're going to start an antidepressant, you should also start self-help CBT. So you are learning about the process of depression. You're, you're learning about actually what causes the problem, and you're also learning about what resolves it. You may need an antidepressant to tranquilize and just to feel a bit calmer so you can you know, think about things a bit more clearly. Mm -hmm. But without doing something as well, you're likely to fall into the category of people that relapse and relapse and relapse. And if mm. you've relapsed probably three times, you'll, well, certainly if you relapse four times, you're likely to be on antidepressant for many years. Mm -hmm. And that has all sorts of consequences that are actually unnecessary, in my opinion. So I'm suggesting that you don't outsource your mental health to an antidepressant. Mm -hmm. you take control of it yourself. You you learn a little bit about it, mm -hmm. and you manage it yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, you would not. Can, well, here's a question for you, Dennis. Can you outsource your physical health? Can you outsource your fitness, for instance? Um, what What do you mean by outsource? Like, can you get I someone to do the exercise for to you? Look after my wellness. No, can you get someone to do the exercise for you? Uh, of course, that, that would not work. Can you get someone to do a diet for you so that you can eat as much as you want, but someone else is on a diet? That would not work. Right. <laughs> so you're, you're basically saying to an antidepressant, antidepressant, manage my depression for me. I don't want to have to do anything about it myself. Mm -hmm. That does not work. And it actually doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So that's why... Uh, depression is a relapsing problem because that strategy doesn't work mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm a you know I'm kind of I'm anti the idea that we persist in thinking that it does work mm -hmm. because actually it's a very poor strategy anyway mm -hmm. so, so basically what you're saying is that it's not enough just to solely rely on antidepressants but you have to you know um, implement changes within for, for you to you know to 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 be able to benefit from um, antidepressants now um Dr. Pubs, let's move on to um, Blues Be Gone. I understand that this is um, a sort of a method that you've developed. So if you could just talk us through about what is actually Blues Be Gone. Well, Blues Be Gone uh, was the first computer program I developed. Mm -hmm. And it was a self-help CBT program. And it was before YouTube. Mm -hmm. And it actually talked to you. It learned about you. It had little animated talking heads that would, that would learn about what you did mm -hmm. and spoke to you. And people developed a relationship with it. And it was kind of fascinating. It was really interesting. I mean, you know, it was, mm -hmm. it was mostly written text with some animations and things. But we we took all of the important agreed ingredients in the CBT treatment of depression and we incorporated them. So people did a little bit every day. We say do a bit every day for five days, take the weekend off. And they went through it and it cured them of depression. And mm -hmm. what's more, they enjoyed learning about what was going on for them. Mm -hmm. So... It was revolutionary, and at the time, it was the most uh, effective uh, C uh, remote CBT treatment. There were only about two or three in the world at the time, and it was the most effective one. Uh, we published data on that. And so we've gone from, sadly, Blues Be Gone is no longer available because it was a, a computer program, and so computers move on, and we just couldn't support it. But we've taken the principles of that, and we've used them in new programs that I have called Anxiety Wizard, Student Stress Buster, uh, anxiety Wizard for the NHS, and I can talk about these a little bit more. So we've taken the approach, and I, I mentioned it briefly earlier on. You need to know what your problem is. Most people don't know what their problem is. Mm -hmm. So someone would say, for instance, uh, I'm depressed. That's my problem. I would say, no, that's not your problem. Your problem is that you're probably chronically underestimating your strengths and resources. And you're probably chronically overestimating your faults and failings. That's your problem. Mm -hmm. That will lead you to be depressed. Or someone might say, I'm anxious. That's my problem. And I'd say, well, actually, that's not your problem. That's, that's your experience. And that's actually a consequence of your problem. Your problem is that your brain is overestimating the threat that you're under. So mm -hmm. I would say to people, I mean, it's, it's kind of obvious. If mm -hmm. someone was to sit in my office and say, I'm really anxious right now. I'd say, OK, look around. Where is the threat? Mm -hmm. There isn't a threat. So why are you anxious now? Well, I'm just anxious. Well, then it's obvious, isn't it, that your brain is overestimating the threat that you're under. Right now, your brain's overestimating the threat. Mm -hmm. That is the problem. So then we create tools that directly address that problem. Mm -hmm. 
And it, I have to say, it, the tools that we use always work. You know, when you can synthesize a problem, be as simple as that, mm -hmm. you can always get a, an outcome, a, be, a beneficial outcome. Now, that's not the complete solution to anxiety. Mm -hmm. But you see how we focus on the thing that's the problem. Mm -hmm. And we make, we make some changes, use some tools, and we practice. We're mm -hmm. big on practice. With self-help CBT, I want you to be doing something every day. Not much, 10 minutes a day. Doing mm -hmm. something every day because you practice your problem every day. Mm -hmm. Don't take three or four days off. I'm going to take the weekend off and not be anxious. No, you practice your problem every day. So you practice an alternative every day. And that you know really works well because mm -hmm. you're always doing something useful. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to pick up on what you said, that the tools that we develop always work. So I, I appreciate that this would sound like a fairly broad question, but can we resolve all psychological problems? Um, the common psychological problems of, let's say, panic, anxiety, mm -hmm. depression, stress, um, OCD to some extent, health anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder. I think we can resolve a good proportion of those. Mm -hmm. um, I would have thought more than 50% of the population that have these problems, I would have thought we could resolve them mm -hmm. relatively straightforwardly. Mm -hmm. Like um, um, panics and trauma. Yeah. Well, even PTSD, you know, we can resolve. I work with that all the time. It's just a, perhaps a little bit more tricky, but it's, it's, it's resolvable. Things, even things such as um, schizophrenia, mm -hmm. and paranoia, you know, the, the more pervasive and the more kind of... Mm -hmm. um, uh, deep-seated problems can be worked with mm -hmm. you know psychological therapy is useful for these kinds of things but it's probably more necessary to have a psychologist or, or a therapist to help with those mm -hmm. but I think a lot of a good a, just certainly a good proportion um, mm -hmm. of problems the common ones that, that you'd work with in for instance in the talking therapy service they could be resolved I would have thought with self-help mm -hmm. CBT Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned something about co um, something, you know, that, like the common um, illnesses. Now, um, let's talk about worry because that's fairly common. Now, from a psychological standpoint, um, is worry just another form of problem solving? Uh, it's Yeah, it's a, it's a maladaptive form of problem solving. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> I think of worry as one of those things that's pretty easy to resolve. Mm -hmm. Because, first, well, first of all, people who worry often think that worry is useful. Mm -hmm. And they'd say something like, well, I'm, if something bad happens, I'm prepared for it. Or they think it's, it's, it, it helps to manage their emotions. And to some degree, the more you worry, perhaps the little bit less anxious you'll be because it feels like you're mm -hmm. doing something useful. But worry is simply a process. Mm -hmm. So look, imagine this, Dennis. <clears throat> I worry about chicken. I worry about money. I worry about the climate. I worry about coronavirus. I worry about driving. And What's Brexit. What's my problem? You forgot to say we also worry about Brexit. Okay, I worry about <laughs> Brexit. <laughs> it's too late for that. <laughs> my worrying about breakfast did, Brexit did not make any difference. Right, I've got five different worries. What's my problem? I worry. Yeah. It doesn't matter what I worry about. It's the process of worry that is the problem. Now, I tend to think of, of worry as being the thinking part of the sensation of anxiety. It's like mm. worry puts a name to the anxiety. It's a focus mm. for your anxiety. But worry is just a process. It's mm. a habit of thought to some degree. Mm. And it's quite possible, and I've done this hundreds of times with people, it's quite possible to actually stop worrying. Mm. I mean, you know, people have different characterological elements, but mm. you know, for a lot of people, they would come to me and they say, yeah, I forgot to worry, I don't worry. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that, if you can show people how to stop worrying, it's really quite remarkable because it really feels uncontrollable for mm -hmm. a lot of people. Mm -hmm. It's just a process. Mm -hmm. now, now, yeah, you mentioned that um, worry is a process, that it actually becomes ingrained, that it turns into a habit. So if you could just explain to us um, how does worry becomes a habit? Yeah. Uh, well, with most psychological problems, people... Uh, seem to accept that the problem is somehow valid. So, so people would say to me, I worry all the time, or I've been anxious for 30 years, or I've been anxious all of my life. Mm -hmm. And I would say, okay, and what have you done about that? Oh, I, I really struggle, I hate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but actually, what have you done? Very few people actually 
try to re-educate their brain in a sense not to mm. worry. So we, we use tools and the, the common mindfulness tools are useful in this circumstance. Uh, we use tools to kind of retrain your brain. Mm -hmm. It's almost to tell your brain that you don't want to worry. Mm -hmm. Because when you accept worry as a valid process, you're kind of saying worry is valid. I worry uh, it's acceptable to worry. I don't like it, but it's, it's what it is. It has to be that way. So we say, no, you don't actually need to worry, but you need to tell your brain you don't want to worry. Mm -hmm. And we use various tools to do that. I mean, simple tools, and it's a classic CBT tool, simply a stop exercise. Mm -hmm. Stick a rubber band on your wrist. Whenever you catch yourself worrying, you see a stop sign, you see a, you see a stop with your mouth, give yourself a twang, mm -hmm. and you put your attention somewhere else. People love that mm -hmm. because it genuinely works to cut the worry. Mm -hmm. and, and over a period of a week or more, people worry a little bit less. Mm -hmm. Instead of worry being uncontrollable, it's now something that you can start to feel like you have some control over. That's huge. You know? mm -hmm. Because most mental health problems have a, a big element of feeling of loss of control. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, when you say tools, um, Dr. Purvis, just to clarify, it's all about self-help CBT, um, is my yeah. understanding right? Now, um, of course, a lot of people who are watching this, they would really ask themselves, um, is it really possible to treat ourselves without the therapist because you know like it sometimes it goes against the common sense you know this thing that you can actually treat yourselves um without um the need for someone who's professional someone who's um who has done a lot of training you know like when you've got um, a toothache you go to a dentist or when something is wrong you see a gp so you know so, something as sensitive about mental health can you really just rely on yourself um well obviously not everyone's going to Mm -hmm. buy into that idea mm -hmm. you do go to a dentist let's say to have some work done on your teeth because you can't do it yourself mm -hmm. you do go to a, an orthopedic surgeon if you have a broken leg because you can't resolve your leg yourself mm -hmm. but psychology is not it's not something that you actually have to have someone mm -hmm. dip their finger into your head and, and actually mm -hmm. manipulate some bits of your brain around mm -hmm. all therapy is to a large degree is the therapist teaching the client mm -hmm. something about themselves, something that they can do, something mm -hmm. that they can understand. It's just a transference of teaching. Mm -hmm. Now you might say, well, <clears throat> the therapeutic relationship um, facilitates that, and it might well do. But you know, you can have a therapeutic relationship with, with me in videos. Mm -hmm. When I used to be a cartoon character in Blues Be Gone, people formed a therapeutic relationship with my cartoon image. And I was just a cartoon image. Interestingly, 20 years ago, I had the same image behind me as well. So I was a cartoon. I looked just like this. <laughs> um, so if you accept that CBT or all therapy to a degree is an element of teaching, mm -hmm. then it's just about how you teach it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that, well, the other thing is human beings are problem solvers. Human beings are always solving problems. Mm -hmm. And I just think that there is a lack of a narrative mm -hmm. in society that says you can solve a mental health problem. Mm -hmm. um, you went to school, Dennis, I guess you learned a bit of history, a bit of geography, a bit of maths, a bit of biology, a bit of chemistry. Did mm -hmm. you learn anything that was useful about your own mental health? Um, I would have to say yes, because I did psychology at uni. <laughs> All oh, right, but I'm talking about high school. School. Oh, no, no, not really. <laughs> right. So you learn all that stuff, which is, mm -hmm. you know, inherently interesting, but you don't, you don't learn anything about how to manage your own mental health, no. which is like, I mean, obviously it's not criminal, but it's practically criminal neglect. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you imagine Wembley Stadium, Wembley Stadium holds 90,000 people. If Wembley Stadium was full of 90,000 people, 16,000 of those will be on an antidepressant. That's and yet you learn nothing at school about managing your mental health. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, I don't think people know how to teach people how to manage their mental health. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easy to teach people what depression is. Mm -hmm. It's a lot harder to teach people how to resolve depression. And I think that's the, that's the lack, right? There isn't, there isn't a narrative that says you can do this, you can help yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, 
the prescriptions for antidepressants are over 70 million a year. Mm -hmm. Probably one, well, probably 1.3 million people are on antidepressants without any medical, valid medical reason right now in the UK. Mm -hmm. So we're medicating a problem, which is not a good solution and mm. because it just perpetuates the problem throughout the life. We're medicating a problem, but we're not actually teaching people how to resolve it. And mm. it's not that difficult. It's, it's really not. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Dr. Purvis, I just want to follow up my question um, about worry. Um, would you say that people's imagination are actually hurting them more? Because um, I've mentioned earlier that so sometimes we, you know, so sometimes we think that worry is just a form of problem solving. And of course, um, a big component of worrying is imagination. So would you say that it's actually more detrimental in the process? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, imagination is a fantastic, mm -hmm. it's, well, it's a fantastic thing. It's a fantastic mm -hmm. element of the human experience. It's absolutely the number one problem if you're going to have a, uh, with a mental health problems, imagination mm -hmm. is, can be very, very damaging. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, worry is like asking your brain mm -hmm. to solve a problem. Now, if we think about the past, the present, or the future, typically we'd think about depression. Oh, I feel like I've failed. I feel like it hasn't got, things haven't gone well. We would typically think about that being in the past. Mm -hmm. So it's like your attention is di directed towards the past. With anxiety, yeah, but it might go terribly wrong. It might go horrible. People might not speak to me. We tend to think of that as being in Mm -hmm. the future okay <clears throat> but we actually live in the present so when you worry yeah but what if nobody speaks to me mm -hmm. okay what if nobody speaks to me well when will i find out i'll find out when i go to that thing and see whether people speak to me mm -hmm. so i'm asking my brain to solve a problem in the present that actually does not have an answer mm -hmm. because the answer to any worry problem any worry problem exists in the future so therefore, it cannot be solved. Therefore, it's a pointless activity. And when I explain that to people, they go, oh, yeah. So we've got this rule, right? Stop asking unanswerable questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. Stop asking your brain to solve problems that do not have answers. It's just obvious, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it, yeah, it, just, in fact, it's just making it really um, difficult for you. Um, Dr. Purves, um, Purves um, I'm sorry. Now, Let's move on to um, depression. Um, what do you think are the psychological components of depression that can be changed? Um, well, you know, there's a whole raft of elements of depression. Mm -hmm. um, I think typically things that are amenable to change mm -hmm. would be things like low self-esteem, perfectionism, uh, ruminative and overthinking processes. Mm -hmm. A loss of power and a loss of a feeling of emotional control. So we could call that emotional regulation, mm -hmm. loss of meaningful activity, uh, loss of physical activity. Um, and uh, typically I find that anxiety and depression go together. So we're likely to have some some elements of fear, some elements of anxiety, uh, poor sleep, poor appetite, mm -hmm. some physiological arousal, which is upsetting and whatnot. So I would have said that um, probably as a, the handful that I've just brought off the top of my head would be important elements that typically we would work with in self-help CBT. Mm -hmm. if, if we take um, uh, low self-esteem as an example, that's a classic uh, example of underestimating yourself. Mm -hmm. And people feel, certainly with low self-esteem, people feel that they, have, that they are the problem often. And so they feel that they have to protect the problem from view and they have to feel like they have to, in a sense, protect people from learning what they're really like or or learning that they feel like a fraud or feel like an imposter, you know. Um, and these are all wrong, of course. I, I I almost never met a person who felt like a fraud who wasn't actually quite successful in every area of their life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so obviously they're underestimating themselves. <clears throat> it's just that we mm -hmm. don't normally we don't think of the problem in those terms, right? Mm -hmm. So if I was to say it to you, how tall are you, Dennis? How tall are you, please? Five feet, four inches. What would be the point in believing you're four foot six? Uh, there's no point in that unless I self-identify as I'm that height. <laughs> so let's just go with no point, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And okay, so what's the point in underestimating yourself? What's the point in believing mm -hmm. that you are less than you are? Well, there's no. no point, is there? No. I did ask a chap that once. He was actually, he said he's five foot 11. I said, no, you're not. Stand up. He's six foot one. I said, well, who buys your clothes for you? He said, my wife buys my clothes. <laughs> I said, you don't know you're six foot one. He says, no, I didn't. I said, that's, that's underestimating yourself. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, th um, I think the word for that in psychology is imposter syndrome. You, you try to, you know, minimize your capabilities. Now, um, let's talk about stress. Um, I understand that um, on some of your writings, you mentioned that stress is optional. Could you just explain that? Because a lot of people say we're not really, you know, we're not really inflicting stress. It's something that it's beyond our control. So if you could just expound on that. Yeah. So I, I developed a thing called the stress nexus. Nexus mm -hmm. being a connection, right? So let me let me show let me share this exercise. This is a practical demonstration, Dennis, right? So we're gonna go like this. Do this. Can you do this for me? Are you able? Mm -hmm. Put some effort into it. Come on, don't be All right. What's happening? What's happening oh, to your hands? It's it's getting warmer. Why? Um because of the friction. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And it's also because it's summer. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Right. So <clears throat> A stress is a is a is a is a connection. It's a relationship between mm. two things. But typically, we think of stress, let's say, as workplace stress. Okay, this is work. This is you. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> work is what it is, and there's not much you can do about that. But mm -hmm. the things that you bring to the workplace, such as feeling like a fraud or an imposter, mm -hmm. such as a propensity to overwork to compensate for feeling like a fraud or a poster, low self-esteem, um, an avoidance of confrontation, a feeling of low emotional control. You bring, those, you bring those things to the workplace. And then what happens is your personal characteristics rub up against the characteristics of the workplace, creating friction, which is experienced as emotional distress. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we recognize the characteristics of uh, your characteristics that you bring to the workplace, and we change them. And commonly, I mean, things like low emotional control are not hard to change because people are typically using false control strategies where they try to control the external world as opposed to using actual real control strategies where they control their internal world, which is the only world they can control. So when we deal with these elements, these personal characteristics elements, and also the compensation strategies like overworking, like avoiding confrontation, uh, like um, uh, taking time off, you know, other kinds of compensation strategies. Once you manage all of these, then you go to work because you want to go to work. Mm -hmm. You do the work because you want to do it, not because you need to do it or you have to do it or you feel coerced or you feel challenged. And all of a sudden, we have this situation. This is the job. People may not care about you in the job, but you know, that's what the job is. And this is you. And you don't need to rub up against it. Mm -hmm. you, don't need to, you don't need to overwork. You don't need to do more than you need to do. So you know, that's what makes stress optional, when we get to the point where we're not rubbing up against the workplace or rubbing up against another relationship or you know, <laughs> families, and any kind of thing, any element where there are two different bits going together can create the stress nexus. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go back to anxiety. I, I know we talk um, about anxiety earlier, but um, I just have um, further questions about anxiety. Um, I understand you also talk about five doors to anxiety. Um, what exactly is five doors to anxiety? <laughs> you put me on the spot, Dennis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Let's see if I can remember what the five doors to anxiety. Most people who are anxious mm -hmm. will have done one or two or more of these things, right? Mm -hmm. The first one is worry. It's, it's, I think it's almost impossible to be anxious and not to worry unless you've got some other kind of issue going on, like alexithymia. Anyway, so worry, um, negative thinking, mm -hmm. avoidance of people, places, things, etc., um, uh, a loss of power and control, uh, and negative thinking. Mm -hmm. So those would typically be the five doors. And if you go through those doors, you, you have to be anxious. Mm -hmm. And so what we think of how we think about it is to come back through the doors. So, for instance, um, uh, if there's an over, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if I mentioned that the, uh, there's a big overestimation of the meaning of physical symptoms and anxiety. Mm -hmm. OK, now. 
people interpret their, ex their physical experiences meaning something powerful, right? I won't be able to control myself. Uh, perhaps I'll have a health concern. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, something's got, something, I'm having a heart attack, which would be very common in panic, right? None of these things are typically accurate. They just, mm -hmm. it's just you're pouring interpretation into the physical symptoms. And that's a big element of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And so we, we retrain attention to recognize that actually the more attention you put into physical symptoms, the greater, the bigger they get, the more mm -hmm. noticeable they get. And, you know, that can become a habit. So we withdraw attention from them. We recognize that it's likely to be up and down. Sometimes you experience something, sometimes you don't. But it's like a broken leg, right? You've either got it or you haven't. You can't have a, you can't think you're having a heart attack now, but I feel okay, I'm not having a heart attack later on. Oh, I feel like I'm having a heart attack again. I'm not having a heart attack. Mm -hmm. It tells you that the symptom itself carries no information. It's not very meaningful. Mm -hmm. But once you, once you realize that, then you can pull back from it and it's not something that has to capture your attention to such an extent. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned earlier that stress is actually optional. Uh -huh. um, what about anxiety? Um, is it also optional? Yeah, definitely. I mean, for, I think for the uh, a majority of people, I would say that anxiety is optional. Mm -hmm. If you know how to exercise the option. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> in my uh, work, I would say problems exist and persist mm -hmm. in the absence of an alternative. So most people who would come into my, into my practice, for instance, mm -hmm. would, you know, would say, I'm anxious. And I'd say, okay, well, what do you do about that? And they go, uh, nothing, really. Nothing meaningful, right? They might avoid going out, or they might avoid driving, or uh, you know, they might take some medication or other, but they don't actually do anything about the anxiety itself. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they're not exercising the option not to be anxious. They're simply accepting their anxiety. Mm -hmm. And so problems exist and persist in the absence of an alternative. I'll say, okay, at its heart, the emotion that underpins all anxiety disorders is fear. Mm -hmm. And we mentioned imagination earlier on. Um, anxiety is an imagined, I don't want to say it's an imagined disorder because it's not, but, but imagination creates anxiety to a large degree mm -hmm. and, and in a lot of people. You know, we imagine things will happen. Mm -hmm. We catastrophize. We take this journey mm -hmm. to catastrophe and back every day. Or well, it's an overestimation, shall we say. It's an overestimation of threat. Mm -hmm. And so when we address that, every psychological problem is benefited by recalibrating to the actual threat level mm -hmm. that you're under. I used to see, I see people a lot who've had road traffic accidents. And... Many, year, many years ago, I came up with this idea. I said, look, yeah, you had a road traffic accident two years ago. You're going to drive home tonight after this meeting. How likely does it feel like you're going to have an accident and get killed, possibly? Mm -hmm. And people will say 70%. Okay, so, so there's a 70% chance you're going to have an accident on the way home and get killed. That's how it feels for you. Yes. I said, well, do you realize why you're really frightened of driving then? I mean, is it true? Mm -hmm. Let's say it was 50%, right? Every two journeys you do, you're going to get killed once. Is that actually what happens to you? No. Mm -hmm. Well, clearly your brain's overestimated the threat, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many journeys have you done? I work it out. 33,000 journeys. How many accidents have you had? One. Okay. If there was a genuine 50% chance, you'd have to have 15,000 accidents, right? Mm -hmm. Clearly, your brain's overestimating the threat. And I know it sounds simple, and it might even sound a bit crass, but, but everybody goes, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Now I understand why I'm frightened of driving, because my brain's overestimating the threat. Yes, this is the tool that we will use to recalibrate your brain to mm -hmm. accurately reflect the threat you're under. Mm -hmm. There's not no threat driving. But it's so low that the benefits of driving outweigh the threat. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, that, that's really a, a, a brilliant um, explanation about, um, you know, how we tend to exaggerate um, the threats when it comes to, you know, um, being worried and being anxious and being stressed um, eventually. Now, um, you, you've gave us a good rundown of, you know, um, the, the, the kind of work that you do. 
Um, I'm just interested to find out, um, Dr. Purvis, if there is a particular individual was the greatest influence to your work. Oh, <laughs> um, I had a, a mentor mm. called Professor Pratushka Clarkson, and she was actually quite, she's a very well known Gestalt therapist. <clears throat> and when I was training in counseling psychology and psychotherapy, <clears throat> I started off in the humanistic field. So mm. I was doing very humanistic um, practices and in a sense training to be a, a let's call it a humanistic more than person centered humanistic um, psychologist. But I also before that I spent five years at, in the Department of Experimental, well, three years in the Department of Experimental Psychology in Oxford and two years in the, in the Department of Experimental Psychology in York working with the rats doing behaviorism. So mm. I was a behavioral scientist, but the only kind of sort of therapy I'd, I'd been exposed to was this this humanistic kind of idea. And I went to Petrushka and I said, look, <clears throat> it doesn't quite sit with me. I want to be a bit more interventionist. I want to be a bit more involved in problem solving. Mm -hmm. She said, you can be a therapist and solve problems. You can be a scientist. You don't have to be a humanistic. You can, you know, you, you can create your own path in a sense. And I, she was my mentor and I worked with her for three years and she had a big influence on me. And I have to say, I mean, her life ended sadly, but I thought she was a great person. She was you know, like a, a big figure in psychology. Um, and I really valued the time that I spent with her. She was a really remarkable woman. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she had a huge library, <laughs> 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 which was quite remarkable. You go, wow. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, uh, you've done a lot of work um, when it comes to promoting self-help CBT, but what is the most important thing you want the public to know about your work? What's the core message? Um, you don't need to outsource. Well, I've got three, really. I think you don't need to outsource your mental health to an antidepressant. Mm. You, can, you can take back control of your mental health mm -hmm. and you can learn to be your own therapist. Mm -hmm. And then you don't need a therapist. Yeah. OK. By the, also... by the time that catches on, I will have retired, so it'll be OK. <laughs> yeah, those are brilliant messages. Now, um, over the years, um, have you? I'm quite sure that you've encountered a number of misconceptions about CBT. So, if you could just kind of identify some of those most common misconceptions and address them. Um, I used to hear the the, the misconception that uh, CBT therapists don't develop don't develop a therapeutic relationship or a working alliance with their mm -hmm. clients, and I thought that was just daft, really. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the other one is that CBT is shallow. It just it just deals with the surface stuff, you know. It, does, it doesn't get down to the sort of the, the real the heart of the matter. <clears throat> I I, I, I'll, I'll share something to you because um, um, I went to University of Hertfordshire, and um, I won't name him, but I have one um, one of our lecturers is really against CBT and is quite famous for that. <laughs> so. Oh. <laughs> I've been quite hearing a lot of things about CBT, but sorry, Carrie, and I just remembered. No, no, that's fair. Um, the thing is, people come to me, mm -hmm. and I guess they go to every therapist, really, mm. to have a problem resolved. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's, I think it's few and far between, they go to just talk about themselves for some years. Mm -hmm. I mean, some might do, but you know, people have a problem with OCD, with PTSD, <clears throat> you know, they can't leave the house, they can't drive, they can't have a personal relationship with people, um, they've got, you know, workplace strife and stress, they can't travel by train, mm -hmm. but their job was in London before the lockdown, you know, people have a problem and they want the problem resolved. And I think ethically and morally, we should resolve the problem that they have mm -hmm. as effectively and as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, and that that's CBT typically because it's focused. Now, it doesn't mean now if people have deeper problems, you know, more personality issues, then we move to schema therapy, mm -hmm. which is a, a, a sort of a broader, broader church of tools and techniques. And I would use EMDR therapy often with trauma mm -hmm. because it's a brilliant way. I mean, I, you know, we use reliving as well, but it's a brilliant way of processing emotional memories. I mean, it's just so quick and so efficient mm -hmm. so you know whilst i'm a cbt therapist i also use emdr i'd use schema therapy um you know mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll use guided imagery which is a big thing i'm a big fan of, of guided imagery work 
Mm -hmm. which is not a million miles from hypnosis, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Now, thank you for addressing those um, misconceptions about CBT. Now, how do you relax what's your distressing outlet? Well, <clears throat> I dance Argentine tango. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I Well, I used to dance Argentine tango before the lockdown. Mm. I, got a, I took a trip to Amsterdam in February, half term, and I went to Amsterdam and danced tango for a bit. Mm -hmm. So that would be my, my big thing. My wife and I dance tango. Mm -hmm. it's, ex it's, it's excruciatingly difficult. Mm -hmm. But once you get to the point where you can do it, it's fabulous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a great... Uh and what do you think you would be doing if you didn't work as a psychologist? Don't don't tell me a tango dancer. <laughs> I know I started far too late. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> well, I don't know. That's an interesting question. Um, I'm taking the next two weeks off and I'm going to be doing painting. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be doing portrait painting and other kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I quite like making videos. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, the subject is psychology, but I quite mm -hmm. like making videos. I like painting. Um, and I also like boating. I have a, I have a history of being on boats. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'd probably potter on. <laughs> okay. And um, finally, Dr. Purvis, what else is in the pipeline? Uh, well, I'm actually remaking Blues Be Gone. Mm -hmm. But first of all, let me say, if any of your listeners are NHS um, workers, or if they they work for a local authority and they have an official email, mm -hmm. then they, they can get access to anxietywizard4nhs.co.uk where mm -hmm. they get free access for life for all of the CBT tools that I have, the self-help CBT tools that I have. Mm -hmm. And so um, I did that because of the, you know, saying thank you to the NHS in a sense. Mm -hmm. So that's anxietywizard4 nhs.co.uk and just sign up. There's no emails, there's no marketing. It's completely free for NHS and associated workers forever. Okay, I'll put that link so for anyone who's watching this and if they're working for the NHS, um, they can take advantage of the tool that you develop. Now, um, it's been an insightful conversation with you, Dr. Purvis, but unfortunately, our time is up. Thank you for sharing your time and your expertise. I look forward to hearing more about your work. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks for taking the time to, to visit. Thank you. Thank you.